Okay, good evening. Welcome to Torah Studies. This week, Parshas Behar. Today is the 16th day of year. Tomorrow night is going to be Lag Ba'omer, the 18th day of year, which we celebrate here. We're all welcome to join to the barbecue with a celebration of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. And the topic we're going to discuss today, the divine is in the details. Not the devil. The divine is in the details. Discovering the majesty of the minutia in Judaism. The little details, how important it is. You know, many times I have I get this question. If people who are learn about doing a certain mitzvah, they're excited. But what they don't get is how come. It is so many details, so many details to certain mitzvahs. I mean, you look at the whole mitzvah. What is the mitzvah? You do, you know, every mitzvah has its thing, connects you with God, whatever, it has its different way. But why the details all you put on the filling, he has to put on this side, he has to put, put, be exactly in the center of the head, and all the details of the tefillin. And you know the details don't, it doesn't stop anything, everything in in Judaism. There's lots and lots of details. So that's what we're going to get today at the end of this class. We're going to learn it from based on the beginning of this week's portion that the Torah talks about about the mitzvah of Shemitah. What is the mitzvah of Shemitah? That every seven year there is a sabbatical. In the land of Israel, it's not a sabbatical that you go take off from vacation, you go see Europe. It is a sabbatical to the land. Once in seven years, we're not allowed to work in the land, to plant, plant, plant plow, and so on. You have to let the fields uh, the ownership of the field allow other people to come and uh, take the, the, the produce. And in, as a matter of fact, this year is the year of Shemitah. This year is the seventh year. So in Israel, there are very, very special laws regarding the laws of, Israel, of uh, the Shemitah this year in Israel. So we're going to see the Pasuk, the verse in this week's portion that discusses this mitzvah. So let's see it inside. There we go. Yeah, this is what we're going to talk here. By Daber Hashem al Moshe Behar Sinai Leimai, and God spoke to my to Moses on the Mount Sinai, saying, "Speak to the children of Israel, and you should say to them, when you come to the land that I am giving you, the land shall rest on a Sabbath to God. You may sow your field for six years." And for six years, you may prune your vineyard and gather and gather in its produce. But in the seventh year, the land shall have a complete rest. A Sabbath to God, you shall not sow your field, nor shall you prune your vineyard. Then the Torah goes on and says, you shall not reap the aftergrowth of your harvest and you shall not pick the grapes you had set aside for yourself, for it shall be a year of rest for the land. And the produce of the Sabbath of the land shall be yours to eat for you, for your male and female slaves, and for your hired worker and resident who live with you. 
and all of its produce may be eaten, also by your domestic animals and by the beasts that are in your land. Okay, now here the question is, we'll go back to the, to the verse. You see right there in the beginning, it says, and God spoke to Moses on the Mount Sinai saying, you know, this verse, Vaidaber Hashem and Moshe, Lamer, the Hashem spoke to Moses, is a very common verse in the Torah. What is not common is when the Torah says where God spoke, that God spoke on the Mount Sinai. Why would God, why would it tell us where he spoke? Why is it necessary to tell us that it was on the Mount Sinai? Everything was given to Moses on the Mount Sinai. So this is the question. And Rashi, the commentator, explains, on the Mount Sinai, says Rashi, what special relevance does the subject of Shemitah, which is the sabbatical year, have with Mount Sinai? Were not all the commandments stated from Sinai? All the commandments were given by Sinai. So why does the Torah mention specifically this about this mitzvah that was given from Sinai. And Rashi explains this teaches us that just as with Shemitah, its general principles and its finer details were all stated from Sinai. Likewise, so it is with every mitzvah. The general principles were stated together with their final details, the final details at Sinai. And why is Shemitah used as the example to prove this rule? The explanation is, unlike other mitzvahs, we do not find the laws of Shemitah reiterated on the plains of Moab in Deuteronomy. You know, in Deuteronomy, right before the Jews enter the land of, the land of Israel, at the plains of Moab, over there, Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses repeats the whole entire tale. But we do not find this part of Shemitah, the laws of the sabbatical, is not reiterated there. Thus, we are compelled to say that its general principles, finer details, and explanations were all stated at Sinai. And this, in turn, tells us that every mitzvah that was conveyed to Moses came from Sinai, including the general principles and the finer details, and that the commandments delineated in the in Deuteronomy were merely repeated and reviewed on the plains of Moab, but not originally given there. Everything was given in the Mount Sinai. So, when you see the example, take example, the mitzvah of shofar. Yeah, the Torah says you have to blow the shofar, but what is a shofar? What kind of animal do you use? The horn of which animal? How? What's the size of a shofar? What kind of sounds do you have to make? All of these details, all of these details were given exactly to Moshe Rabbeinu at Mount Sinai. And, um, however, the question is, what difference does it make? What difference does it make whether the mitzvahs were given in the Mount Sinai or was given in the plains of Moab or was given a, 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 anywhere else? And number two, why is it that this mitzvah of Shemitah, let's say it's important to know that it's given from Sinai, but why is that mitzvah chosen to be the mitzvah to teach us that detail that all of the mitzvahs was given from Sinai. What's so special about the mitzvah of Shemitah, the mitzvah of the sabbatical? Must be a reason. And finally, number three, what we need to understand also is the question that we started today. Why all these details? Why all these intricate details? You know, everything, everything has exact laws. You go, you 
put on your shoes in the morning. You have to tie your right shoe first and then your left shoe. And then you have to, uh, no, put on the right shoe and then put on the left shoe. Then tie your left shoe and then tie your right shoe. Everything God tells us what to do. Everything the Allah, the Allah, the law, the code of Jewish law. Why all these details? Why is it important? Isn't that more important? We should just, you know, pray, have some things in common. Things, certain things I can understand what it makes, what it does to us. Yes, put on the feeling God commanded us, but all these details, why are those details important? In a sense, it makes us even dif- more difficult. So, before we get there, we're going to learn a little more. We'll see a little more details that we find in the mitzvah itself. In that particular mitzvah, the mitzvah of Shemitah. And in the mitzvah of Shemitah, what is the mitzvah of Shemitah? In the mitzvah, is, the, the mitzvah of Shemitah tells us that we cannot work in the field in the seventh year. That's number one. In addition to that, there is also a commandment, a positive commandment, that the earth must rest. So, you know, in the mitzvahs in the Torah in general, the mitzvahs are divided into negative commandments, things, the prohibitions, and the positive commandments. So here, too, we find that there is a mitzvah in the mitzvah of Shemitah has both that the, the, to, the, the earth, that you should not work in the field. And then there is a positive commandment that, that mitzvah must rest. And the question is, the positive commandment, why is the positive commandment given? Is the positive commandment given that the person has to stop working, has to not work? Or is the mitzvah a positive commandment about the, about the land, that the land has to rest? In other words, we're going to learn a little bit in a yeshiva style, understanding a little, we're going to put on uh, our Talmudic hat. If you go into yeshiva, they have different, very subtle arguments and different, they basically split hairs. We're going to have a little taste of a yeshiva here in this concept. There is something that is called chiyuv gavra or chiyuv heftza, an obligation on the person or an obligation of the object. What does that mean? So, for example, here in this case, the mitzvah of Shemitah, that the that the Torah says, you are not allowed to work on the seventh years and the seventh year in the field. The question though is, when the Torah says you are not allowed to work, is this a commandment on the gavra and the person that a person cannot work? Or is the commandment on the chefza, the object, the field has to rest? So you're going to ask me, Rabbi, what difference does it make? It's all the same. You're not allowed to work. The field is not allowed to, the field has to rest. What's, what, makes, what difference does it make? So the Rabbi points out that there might be a difference. If you would say that the mitzvah, a commandment that God gives, is that the person is not allowed to work in the field, then what if you have an Andrew working in the field? Do you have to stop him? If the commandment is on a person, then an Anjou is not part of the commanded in the Torah, then you don't have to stop him. He can, he can go. But if the mitzvah is not on the person, but if the mitzvah is a chiv chefza, is an obligation on the object, on the field, that the field needs, needs to rest, then it doesn't make a difference who works. You're not allowed to hire an Anjou or even if it's an Anjou comes and works in your field, if you don't stop him, you're violating the mitzvah. Let's see it inside. What the Rebbe says. Those are the three questions we asked. Is it gavra, is it chafzah? 
So here we find in the Maimonides as a mitzvah, it is a positive commandment to rest from performing agricultural work with trees in the sabbatical year. And this, the mitzvah is addressed to the owner, to the person. But then the Rambam says also, he, the Rambam is not clear, doesn't make us clear. The Maimonides, this is one quote of the Maimonides, but there's another quote of, that, of the Maimonides that seems the opposite. He says, what is the mitzvah? He describes the mitzvah in the introduction to the, these mitzvahs, these laws. The Rambam says, that the earth should rest. The earth should rest from, uh, in the seventh year from all labor performed because of it. So here it sounds like this mitzvah is addressed to the land, not to the person. So the Ramam here doesn't help us much. Which one is it? And the Rebbe comes here and says, okay, so what is the difference? This is one of the practical difference in this, this the distinction would take, would make if the mitzvah is that the Jews' land should be left alone, untouched in the sabbatical year, then it makes no difference who is to blame for violating this restri- the restraining order. Regardless of who does the work on Jewish owned land, even if it was a Gentile, the landowner is liable for violating the positive mitzvah. So, however, if the mitzvah is addressed to the person, then when a Gentile works the field, the landowner is not considered to be violating the mitzvah. So that is, that is why it's important to know, because it really makes a difference in halacha. It's important to know, to split the hair, what is the commandment? Is the commandment to the person, or is the commandment to the field? There's another example in the laws of Shemitah. There's another example of the laws of Shemitah uh, regarding Hefker. What is Hefker? In addition to the fact that we're not allowed to work in the field, during the time, the year of Shemitah, also you need to, you need to Remove your ownership of the field, meaning you have to give it, you have to allow everybody, everybody to come eat in the field. Here also is the question, is the obligation a gavrek obligation, a personal obligation, or is it obligation on the field? What does that mean? If you say it's an obligation on the person, if the person is command, commanded to Take to give the free, uh, uh, the free the field away free, meaning people are you know, removes his ownership from the produce. Then, or is it that the Torah says that the that the field is hefker? On that year, when the year comes automatically, the field is ownerless. In other words, the Torah removes your ownership from the produce, not the person. What, what difference would it make over here? So here is also a difference. Let's say, if we say that the ownership, the obligation is on the person to remove his ownership. So what happens if a Jew did not do it? If you did not do it, you didn't remove your ownership, and on the contrary, you went and you locked up, you put up a gate, a fence, no one can enter the, the field. So what happens if someone, another Jew, comes and takes from that field that you did not remove your ownership, you didn't make it hefker, then that person is actually stealing. The person who owns the field, the landowner, violated the mitzvah of removing the ownership. He didn't remove his ownership. He kept it to himself. So he violated that mitzvah. But still, since he did not remove his ownership, then no one is allowed to take it. But if we say that the Torah commands the field, that the field should be ownerless, then automatically it becomes ownerless. It's not considered, it's not considered gazel, it's not considered stealing 
if a person comes and takes it. So those are the details. Okay, this is what the Torah says. But in the seventh year, uh, you shall release, release it and abandon it. The poor of you people shall eat it. And what they leave over, the beasts of the field shall eat. So shall you do to your vineyard and to your olive trees. And as the Maman is explained, it is a positive commandment to divest oneself from everything that the land produces in the sabbatical year. Anyone who locks his vineyard or fences off his field in the sabbatical year has nullified a positive commandment. This also holds true if he gathered all this produce into his home. Instead, he should leave everything ownerless. Thus, everyone has equal right in every place. As the verse states, and the poor of your people shall eat it. Okay, so here's the same question. Is that mitzvah and the gavra or the chefza? Is mitzvah and the person, one must actively declare the fruit to be ownerless? Or is the mitzvah and the chefza that the object, anything that grows, is automatically ownerless? And now comes the Sefer Chinuch and says the difference what we said what we said before. One me, one way of understanding this mitzvah is that it's an address to the person, namely the Torah commands the landowner to declare his produce ownerless in the seventh year. Thus, if he declares it ownerless, it indeed is. But if he doesn't, it is not while he is still considered to be violating of the mitzvah, because he didn't declare ownerless, but the produce nevertheless belongs to him. And it's not up for grabs. As such, anyone who helps themselves to the goods is stealing, because the owner did not make it ownerless. Or perhaps, but if we say the other way around, or perhaps this rule of ownerless produce doesn't imply that the owner has to do anything to make it ownerless, but rather everything becomes ownerless automatically by divine decree. The only way the owner can violate this is if he actively locks the gate of his field and vineyard. Accordingly, if someone were to take the produce against the will of the owner, it would certainly belong to him, as it is ownerless. So the Rebbe actually talks about it in the Sicha, and the Rebbe goes in details, and the Rebbe really proved that the solution to this question is that the, the detail, that the law is really a law of gavra on the person. That the person has the obligation to make it. The person has the obligation to keep the Shemitah. And the Rebbe proves it from different things, from the laws of, of, uh, of the, the money that during the seventh year, the, the loan is being, the debts is being erased. So, but we're not going to go into this. But, but in any case, the Rebbe proves that this is this is the answer. The answer is that this is a mitzvah of gavra, the person God knows it. But in any case, all of this really brings, like, raises the question more. Why? Why all these details? Why is it so important, these intricate details, splitting the hair, splitting hairs in, in every detail? What is this? Whose mitzvah is it? The person's mitzvah is the field mitzvah. Why, why all this? all these details. So really, to understand what it means, we need to understand to get a little different perspective 
And what the details, what the details of a mitzvah, the intrinsic details that every mitzvah has, what, what, is, what is it for? So the, on the one hand, we can say, you have a mitzvah, God commanded us to do, put on the filling, but we have to do, know how to put on the filling. In order to know how to put on the filling, you have to learn the laws. What kind of tefillin? What does God want? What kind of tefillin? What shape? And so all the details. So you do it the way Hashem wants. What are those details? The details is to do the tefillin the way Hashem wants. But basically, we, we can say that the, the details is just, it just some, and parts in, in, in leading us to do the, the actual mitzvah. The mitzvah is the tefillin. What the tefillin represents. And the details is to do what Hashem wants the way the way the way it is. The Maimonides takes gives a, 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 an explanation like this in the Moren Nevochim, the guide for the perplexed. It says the Maimonides as follows: I will now tell you what an intelligent person ought to believe in this respect, namely. That each commandment has necessarily a cause. There's a cause, there's a reason for every commandment. As far as its general character is concerned, and serves a certain object, objective. But as regards to its details, we hold that it has no uh, ulterior object. So this is an answer that Maimonides gave the guide for the perplexed to the people in his generation that he needed to answer to, they had so many questions and he needed to guide them in certain ways, the way they understand. One of the examples that Maimonides brings is the, for example, the laws of Shechita. There's a purpose, there is a reason why God commanded us to do the Shechita. The Shechita means the slaughtering of the animal to make it kosher. So many, many, many details how. When you ask, uh, you ask what, is, what, what does it mean, kosher food? That's not, it's not meat that the rabbi blessed. <laughs> it has to be from a kosher animal. It has to be slaughtered in the proper way. And the one, the shoichet, that the slaughterers it has, needs, needs to know many, many details. But all of these details, says the Rambam, the details are not part of the main reason of what the mitzvah is all about. The mitzvah is to do what Hashem wants to slaughter. How? There's many details. But when you take this approach, this understanding, the way the Rambam explains it there, it, it raises some questions. It raises, when, you, when you think about all these details, the details now becomes a burden. Yes, I know I want to do what Hashem wants, but why so many details? Why do we have to do it this way and that way and that? All these things. In addition, also, it, 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 it may, you may, when you get involved so much in the details, you may forget about the main, you, you may lose the forest from the trees. You see, involved so many details, you may forget about the main reason of what the, the mitzvah is all about. But here comes the answer, the way Hasidus sees this. That gives us the explanation of the beginning, what we asked in the beginning of the, of the portion, what the Shemitah in by Mount Sinai. Hasidus gives us an explanation. The word mitzvah, mitzvah means a commandment, but mitzvah also means a connection, tzavta. A mitzvah connects us with Hashem. How does a mitzvah connect us with Hashem? Why? Because a mitzvah is a ratzain ha'elyon. A mitzvah is a divine will. It is what Hashem wants from you. What Hashem wants is not something that He decided that He needs. He needs us to do something. It is his will. It's a one-sided will. It's not that he decided that a Jew needs 
to have a better day, to start, I, I want you to do this thing. It has nothing to do with you. It is Hashem's will. God's will, God's eternal, essential will, a one-sided will that comes from Hashem. It is the mitzvah should be, should be done with all of its details. Every single detail, if you look at the details, not as something that leads you to a goal, but the detail itself is God's will, then the whole understanding, the whole appreciation of doing a, a mitzvah and even doing a small part of the mitzvah gets a whole different appreciation. Let's see how the Rebbe Rashab explains what the mitzvah is, what the will of Hashem in the mitzvah. This is from the Rebbe Rashab, the fifth Lubavitch Rebbe, Rabbi Shalom Dovber. He says, God desires that we fulfill the mitzvahs as a deep, absolute level, at a deep, absolute level. In other words, God is entirely invested, so to speak, in his desire for us to fulfill the mitzvah. It is the very essence of Hashem. This will exist independently, entirely one-sided from Hashem. It has nothing to do with us. It's Hashem's one-sided will. As such, this will is not subject to change or expiration. Rather, it is, a, it is absolute and eternal. So what then did the sages mean when they stated, what does God care where precisely the location of slaughter takes place? Like we mentioned before, the slaughtering, where exactly, what's, what place it takes, uh, uh, takes place, the slaughtering? If the will invested in a mitzvah is God's deep-seated desire, of course it cares. So that seems to be contradicting to what we said. We said that the deep the will of Hashem is God's real desire. Every detail is part of Hashem. So why does the matter say that it really makes no difference to Hashem where you slaughter it? So the answer is, I'd say the statement is only on the external. Utilitarian level, meaning the level that it makes you what, what it's useful for, what the mitzvah is useful for. However, at the deep, absolute, and one-sided level, so to speak, God most certainly does care. After all, a mitzvah is the manifestation of God's deepest, one-sided desire. And in that state, God wishes that the mitzvah be performed in a specific way, regardless of anything or anyone else, period. As such, only when performed with the precision does it reflect God's true will. And the Rebbe explains what this means. The Rebbe says, in other words, even the tiniest detail of a mitzvah are part of this one-sided absolute desire, reflective of God's true absolute nature. Okay. So this, this is what the Rebbe explains now. What this parsha, what the question we asked, when the Torah says that the mitzvahs was given, Hashem spoke to Moshe Behar Sinai in the Mount Sinai. And Rashi says to teachers that all of the details was given from Sinai. And we ask the question, what difference does it make where it was given? That exactly is the message. The message what the Torah is telling us, that we should know, that you shouldn't think 
that the mitzvah is one thing. God gave us a general mitzvah, do this, do celebrate Pesach, celebrate Shabbos, celebrate this. How exactly? Who cares? No, Hashem cares. That even the mitzvahs, even the details of the mitzvahs was given at the Mount Sinai. The innovation in, uh, in our Torah portion is that its general rules and finer details were at Sinai, were said at Sinai. Even the details and minutia associated only with how to carry out the mitzvah, they too are part of the real mitzvah, namely that deep one-sided uh, godly desire. Thus, they too were stated at Sinai a one-sided godly overture. So that's the answer over here. And and here also says the Rebbe that what is it, we asked the question, well, why was it chosen that particular mitzvah? Why was it chosen that particular mitzvah? to teach us about this law, that everything was given from Sinai, even the details. Says the Rebbe, what mitzvah are we talking about? We're talking about the mitzvah of Shemitah. What is the mitzvah of Shemitah? The sabbatical year, that when the Jews will enter the land of Israel, and they will settle there. And then, you know, it takes seven years to, to conquer, seven years to settle, it took. And they plant, and they have every seven, then seven years later, they will have a Shemitah year. Where was it said? At Sinai. When? How long before they entered? They spent in the desert 40 years. There was no field in the desert. There was no, those law, laws did not apply to the, to, it wasn't relevant at all. Not until many, many decades later. So think about it. Hashem is telling them mitzvahs. And he's telling them all of the details. If, if, if this is why, why is he telling them then? Tell them 40 years later, 50 years later, before they come into the land of Israel, tell them exactly, okay, you're now going to the land. I want you to know the details. If you want to tell them the, the law in general, tell them that in general there is a mitzvah of Shemitah. But to tell all the details right there in Sinai 50 years earlier, that itself shows us that the fact that Hashem gave all of the details at Sinai, it shows us that the details count. It's not just the big picture. The small details are the big picture. The details, how we keep a mitzvah, is important, as important as the big picture. As the Rebbe says here, One can argue and say that at Sinai, the details and nuances were stated only vis-a-vis -vis those mitzvahs that were immediately re re relevant, such as the Ten Commandments and the various civil laws given immediately thereafter. But with regard to the other mitzvahs that were only to be carried out at a later date, one can argue that, that only the overall precept was stated at Sinai, whereas all the technical details were saved for later, closer to a time and situation when they would be relevant. Shemitah is one such mitzvah, as it would only take effect much later, after settling the land. This, then, is the big idea contained in our Parsha. Specifically, the Parsha that speaks about Shemitah. When we say that the over, overall precept and the details were stated at Sinai, the message is that even details that are not relevant until much later, they too were said and a part of God's manifestation at Sinai.
So you see the mitzvah, the mitzvah can be a commandment, and the mitzvah is also a connection. So if you look at the mitzvah like a, like a connection, like a rope that connects you, you know, that says, the Alter Rebbe says in Tanya that the 613 mitzvahs are like a rope with 613 different strings. Each string connects us to the will of Hashem in, in, in this particular way. And when you go into more details, every single detail of the mitzvah is also the will of Hashem. And therefore, that also connects you to Hashem in a specific, unique way. It's interesting, the Rebbe sometimes would tell people when they had physical problems, and the Rebbe would tell them to be careful in this particular mitzvah, that particular mitzvah, because... The, 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 the life of a Jew is also connected through these mitzvahs to Hashem. So therefore, what we see from here is about the importance of the mitzvahs, about the importance of the details of the mitzvah. And, and the lesson is, is, is twofold. On the one hand, if a person, let's say, is in a very dark place, and you say, I need to lift them up. I need to save this person. I need to bring them to a good place. How do I do it? So you could say, yeah, I'm going to enlighten them. I'm going to show them the light. I'm going to show them the truth. I'm going to prove to him that there is God. I'm going to lift them up. How? Knowing that a detail of a mitzvah is part of the will of Hashem, so if you get him to do even one small detail of a mitzvah, that itself can also lift him up. Even if it's just a detail of a mitzvah. The Rebbe says something along these lines. When a person engages in bringing another Jew's heart closer to God and his Torah, it is possible they might entertain the following thought. If I have the opportunity to influence another Jew, let me focus on the basic critical mitzvahs and the big overarching precepts. That's more than enough. There is no need to expand so much effort trying to influence them to be attentive to the smaller, more trivial matters such as minutia from the rabbis, the biblical laws, the answer to such a thought is, it is entirely possible that by influencing another Jew to be attentive to a smaller, more trivial Torah matter, that will be the linchpin to pull them out of the deepest abyss to the greatest of heights. So what do we take from here? Yes, we are excited sometimes to, to do Pesach. We're excited to do Kiddush Friday night. But let's, let's take upon ourselves to do, to focus. If let's say we do a mitzvah, let's try to focus more on the details of the mitzvah. Um, we say we make Kiddush to learn exactly how to hold a cup, which hand to hold it. There is customs, obviously there's different ways. Um, you know, to see, you say Shema, you may, may focus more on the words and the letters. Each mitzvah has many, many details. So mitzvahs that we do already, let's focus more on the details also because the details count. And of course, there is, it doesn't mean that the person that doesn't do all of the details is not good. Obviously, as we say, God wants the heart, wants the meaning, wants the sincerity. Yes, but it's, but it's not a contradiction to the fact 
that we say that Hashem wants a hug. Of course, He wants us the sincerity, and that's what counts. But when we realize how the details, the even the rabbinical parts, the details of the mitzvahs are godly, then those details are not going to be a burden. Those details are going to be an opportunity. Every detail will create another bond and another channel that connects us to the godly energy in a different way. And to have a healthy body is to have a healthy soul in every part. So let us hope we should all have healthy bodies and healthy souls and be connected to Hashem in every way possible. And with the, the, these details, Hashem will give us the, the big picture. The big picture will be the redemption of all Am Israel, the whole world, and the coming of Mashiach. So thank you so much for joining tonight. And don't forget, Mitz Hashem, tomorrow we have the big party, Lag Ba'imer celebration with the barbecue, with the bonfire. In the honor of Rabbi Shimon Bayechai, join us tomorrow at the Chabaras, tomorrow evening, starting from 6 p.m. and on. Thank you.